All right, intro number two, episode 77, KT Confidential. Welcome. Oh, also, Welcome. episode five of Quarantine. No, what? this is like episode uh, seven or eight now of Quarantine. No, it's not. Yeah. I'll well, have to go back. Here, I'll, I'll tell you right now, because the last day we were in the office was March the 12th, uh, 13th. No, yeah. So the March 16th podcast was recorded on the 13th, because that was the day we recorded that one. Yeah. So we have the 23rd, the 30th, the 6th, the 13th, the oh, 20th. Seven. Yeah, this is the 7th episode. Well, that's, see, I, I've lost all sense of time and... Well, can you believe when this episode airs on May the 4th that we're into May? It's yeah. crazy. Crazy. Almost yeah. two months of being at home. It is. So um, anything new and exciting? I haven't really seen you or chatted with you uh, at all in uh, the last week. No. Uh, no? Part for the course. Everything's the same as usual. Um Stuck indoors, not really going out much. I've been wa- watching and reading a lot um, of stuff on COVID, and there's a lot of people saying that the whole uh, self isolation and quarantine and keeping people indoors and shutting down business is um, not necessary and causing more harm than good. And these are reputable, like educated doctors, and it's really interesting to get different people's opinion on the matter. And they're showing statistics from countries that are doing it and are not doing it and how there's very little difference or no difference at all. Well, I don't know about that. You look at Sweden and uh, their numbers are are going up and and they don't uh, have everybody in a lockdown there. But um, it's, it's real interesting because you're getting perspectives. It's opinions. It's like... yeah. Well, we say about the value of somebody's home, you could have five different realtors give, and chances are all five of them will give you different valuations on your property yeah. um, or, you know, raising children. I've, I've read a lot of books and articles lately on, on kids and toddlers and raising kids and, and um, everybody's got something to say. So I think that's... Of course. Everybody's got something to say right now. My opinion is um, I don't think that we're doing enough to to shut things down, shut everybody down. Um, but then people will think there will be people that think I'm crazy by saying that. So... I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I, I know for me, I've been now, again, since March 13th at home. Um, yeah, me too. I haven't, haven't left with the exception of walking the dog. I took uh, both cars for a, a quick drive around the neighborhood uh, twice, twice now. Um, but that's it. Like from the house into the car drive around a little bit, get the tires moving, get the fluids moving, and then back into the garage um, and driving slowly and and safely to make sure that, you know, don't get into a fender bender or anything like that. But um, I, I, I believe that in the next couple of months, things are, hopefully going to start to open up and and get back to normal. But my fear, especially for us in our business is there's, there's no, there's no middle point. I don't think there is a middle middle ground, right? Like you're either out showing properties or you're not right. Um, You're either doing open houses or you're not. And some people are doing these virtual open houses, but you know what? I mean, what's the difference between a couple of videos or somebody being in the home virtually, or even the 360 that uh, we do with Matterport and GoPro people want to be in the house, right? There's, like no, wanna, there's no way unless you're <clears throat> buying you construction. No, right. no right. people that buy resale, they need to see the house. I mean, yeah. they can, and we've experienced it with our, 
our team, they've been able to uh, narrow down the list of um, likely homes of in, homes of interest, uh, so that they only have to go see a couple. Yeah. Uh, whereas before, uh, they you know we we may be more inclined just to go take them to see all those seven houses because you never know maybe one of them will surprise you and you, you'll you'll be more impressed than you were online. But now, given the circumstances, you know, narrow it down quickly, go see a couple. And, you know, it's been working. Um, well, in the past, what I would do, like if I had a uh, conversation with a buyer and we sat down and we had that face-to-face meeting, uh, most of the time at our um, uh, office on Main Street, um, I would say, all right, we're going to go and see six or seven homes on Saturday and six or seven homes on Sunday. And I'm going to show you everything from the bottom of your uh, price range to the top of your price range and a couple of things that you may like and a couple of, a couple of properties you may like and a couple of properties you might not like and then everything right. in between. Um, but now you're doing that virtually where you're pulling up the listings, you're having a, a Zoom conference and, and pulling up the listings during that uh, conversation and going through the listings virtually together to make sure that the homes that you're going to see are the homes that are going to be in contention. Uh, so that's the difference right now. But I, I look at the stats from the house we sold last week on uh, Kavanaugh Lane. And uh, so we sold that home with three offers on it. And there were eight showings. So typically a home like that would have had, in that time frame, probably 20 showings or maybe a little bit more. And not necessarily resulted in more offers, like three three offers on a property like that is 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 okay, it's good. Um, so the real buyers are out right now, and they are narrowing it down, so you know that's uh, that's becoming more efficient. But my question now to you is, let's say we're in November and things have gone back to normal like if if they don't go back to normal in November, I would be shocked, right? Like you got to think six months from now, things are better be back to normal. If they're not, people are going to be fucking bankrupt. The world's going to be in shambles. Well, people are going to be bankrupt now. I know. The world is in shambles. Um, I know. I understand. I'm not downplaying the severity of the current situation. I'm just saying if that were to become reality, it would be a very different situation well every you know uh everybody's situation will be different uh the government is going to be um looking at their finances and going well we've been yeah you know putting out all this money over the last few months but now we ain't got no money either (laughs) so so you know and it's inevitable that it will have to go back to normal whatever normal will be but my question is knowing that there's still going to be distancing um, guidelines. Uh, there's still going to be new protocols uh, implemented for many businesses. We're still an essential business. We've just decided to basically shut things down uh, for the betterment of, of the public. Well, and and just to, to clarify that, by essential, you know, the caveat is um, you shouldn't be out doing your job if it's not an essential transaction correct right like people that need to move need to move and you know because things are still moving those we need to help facilitate those transactions but if you're trying to buy a cottage or a second property or uh you know just casually looking you know they should not be out it's funny you mentioned the cottage because one of the things i'm considering Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at the uh, home I was telling you about the other day, but one of my dream homes in Milton, a home that, okay, I won't call it a dream home, but I will call it a dream home. It's that one of those balances, (laughs) if that makes sense, where um, if I were to stay in town, yeah, uh, this is one of the homes. I'm going to pull it up because I haven't looked at it yet. This is one of the homes that um, I would heavily consider purchasing for myself. 
Um, it's a home that I've had my eye on since it's been built, which I don't know how many years ago now it was built. I want to say maybe it's less than 10 years old. Um, so this home came on the market about a month and a half ago or so. Yeah. And we won't man- mention addresses or, or whatever, but, um, it's a, uh, it's a heritage home. It was deemed a heritage home by, uh, by Milton. And, um, it was rebuilt by a local builder and it's, it's perfect for my family. Um, in pretty much with the exception of lacking one extra bedroom, it's a bungalow. So, um, it's, it's a little bit smaller in that sense. Yeah. Um, but with the exception of, that one extra bedroom that we could use, it's got everything else that we would want. Um, but to facilitate that move and in order to get a pool, which because it doesn't have a pool and, and that's on our must have list uh, this time around, in order to get the pool and be able to facilitate this move, we would have to sell our cottage. And uh, I don't think there's much of a market for it, uh, at this moment, right? Like who is actually going to represent a cottage buyer right now? Um, uh, your sister-in-law might, might pipe up and say, Hey, well I will, but how many buyers really are going to be out there buying a cottage if they don't have to, right? No, I mean, there, there will, I think very soon though, we will see people, um, although the market hasn't dropped much, um, if it does, there will be people out there trying to get a deal mm-hmm. and buy low and then perhaps just flip or sell later. I think there will be deals. I think there will be deals on cottages. Yeah. Um, but what I wouldn't be surprised to see happen for cottages anyways is properties that wouldn't have otherwise come on the market will now be on the market, whether it's people not wanting to pay for it anymore or can't afford it or recognizing it's a luxury they don't need and cut back costs um, or even downsizing their cottage and purchasing another cottage. But properties that you wouldn't normally see on the market in areas or on lakes that you wouldn't normally see will all of a sudden pop up. And I think there will be interest in it and you might garner multiple offers on those types of properties. So, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Um, I think a lot of investors also will be making uh, decisions that they haven't had to make in a while. So if you have a rental property or two or three or four, um, all of a sudden you're looking at it and going, well, if I sell property three and four, I can use that equity to pay off the other properties and sit without mortgages on them right now uh, until um, I get my finances back in order, and then I can use them as leverage for other properties in the future. So I think we're going to see a weird dynamic shift happening over the next um, six months to a year, is my guess. Yeah. Um, and I'm really curious to see what it does in terms of pricing. I don't think it's going to affect the prices too much because like we've seen now, you've got sellers that have to sell. And then you've got buyers that have to buy. And that's not going to change. So even though there's going to be buyers out there looking for the deals and looking for opportunities, I don't know how many of those there are going to be. Right. Supply will be low. That's the thing, yeah. I mean, the current inventory is going to dry up over at some point because not many new listings are coming to market. So what do you think, because I've got this question a lot and we had, uh, I had that question DM to me. Um, what do you think is going to happen in terms of which properties are going to be affected the most in the next several, several months? Do you think... Um, 
from my perspective, I don't think it will affect. I think the only market where um, you may might see it is in the Uber luxury market because I think that those people have more money invested in the market. So not the real estate market. What's, what's your consideration in terms of value on that? Is it like over three million, over five million? I guess it depends on the market, but I would say like even two to three on the low end, maybe. But yeah. well, Uber luxury think, isn't two million. Mm-hmm. It's a luxury home, but well, it depends on the house. It depends on the area. Like a right two million dollar right. home in Acton is is. <laughs> it's probably a nice fucking house. <laughs> um, not yeah, not that uh, you see many of those. Um, if you got two million dollars, you're probably not moving to Acton. Unless you're buying hey, land. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> okay, there I get it. I know. Nice Acton's rural, up, I don't know. It there is, are some yeah, yeah. really nice rural properties in Acton <clears throat> that uh, yeah. are quite pricey. Yes. Um, uh, so my my thoughts are, though, is, um, you know, the market. The luxury market. Up. The lux- Let's yeah. just say luxury. And my, my only, th- the, the reason for that, the driving force of that is just people's investments are down. People have lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in investments in the market. Um, I don't know. So, the market's bounced back pretty good lately, but uh, yeah. yeah, but it's I mean, so everybody's, volatile, down. Like, Everybody, everybody's down. I mean, everybody's cost of living uh, is putting them in a worse financial position right now than they were two months yeah. ago. Right. Yeah. But I mean, the market hasn't come down much. Maybe five percent still, somewhere in that range. It's been holding. Well, pretty the stats steady. on the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board uh, was year over year uh, down one point six percent so far for the month of April. Uh, yeah. That was as of April twenty first. So uh, down one point six. But in realistic uh, um, numbers, because that takes the average of all of their trades that are done on their system, um, realistic numbers. I think you're, you're accurate, uh, 5% kind of on average, um, through Milton and Oakville. Um, and, and again, stats will say that I'm wrong and you're wrong by saying that, but here's what I know. Just thinking about the property that we sold last week, it sold for several percent. I'd have to really kind of think about it for a minute, but let's say about 4% less than probably what it would have sold for in the very beginning of March or end of February. It sold for right. four, about 4% less. It ended up selling... So, when I had the discussion with um, the listing agent on our team, which was Heather, um, I said, listen, you have to price it at a price low enough to encourage people to either make an offer on it unseen or to actually get out of the house and go and physically see the home in person. Yeah. And you know, it's not what we want to do or what the sellers necessarily want to hear because in this market, you think, okay, well, if I'm listing it low, what are the odds that I'm going to get multiple offers? And your odds are much lower, right? In a busy market, you list it low and and hope to get a lot of offers and, and get people bidding against each other on it. Um, it ended up happening anyways. They ended up listing low and getting multiples. We sold over asking and they sold um, in a very quick amount of time when there are a bunch of other similar homes still on the market because they're still pricing it as if it was the beginning or middle of March and not, yeah. and not realizing how to do that. And so my answer to the market being forced down by four or five percent is listen right now the market for buyers is different than it was two months ago they are in a little bit more control than they were two months ago it's not a buyer's market but it's not a seller's market right now Um, and a home is only worth as much as somebody is willing 
to pay for it. That is the definition of market value, what somebody is willing to pay. And if somebody's willing to pay today what they would have paid two months ago, it has to be a really, really unique property or a property that they can't replace um, or something that they've just been looking for uh, for a long time. Yeah. So going well, back to this house, I don't know if you checked it out while I was rambling on here. I glanced back, at it. Yeah, going back to this house that I'm interested in, it, this is the first time it's come available since it was built and, and sold as a, uh, as a new home, basically. And uh, I've had my eyes on it for, for a while because every time I drive past it, I love it. And um, it sides onto a park and, and has space for a nice pool. Um, it's nicely renovated. Um, but it puts me in a position, right? Because then I have to list my home, um, which means I got to get some renovations done. Uh, like my uh, stairs need to be refinished. The dog yeah. and the kid uh, scratch them up pretty good. And, um, and then during showings, what am I doing with our family? Right? Like well, we, haven't left the house. we haven't left the house in, in eight weeks. Yeah. So, uh, so it becomes a, uh, a moot point because even though I'd like to make that transaction, we don't need to, we don't need to. So we're going to sit on the sidelines and say, well, we missed our dream home potentially if they end up selling. Um, but it is what it is, right? So anyway, I think you're right. I think the luxury market is going to be the most affected. Um, just because of percentages, right? Like if you think of it, the smallest amount of homes transacted in terms of numbers are those in the luxury market in, in most markets. Yeah, uh, Oakville, a little bit different, but depends what you classify to your point as luxury in Oakville because luxury in Oakville really is like 4 million plus, I would say. Yeah. Uh, maybe three. It depends on the area of Oakville. Like if you're in old Oakville, a $3 million house buys you not much. Um, so I think those, those luxury homes uh, will be seeing less activity. I think the big thing also going back to your point about pricing is um, for people that are in a position where they have to sell, it's really important to understand where the market is, where, how it's trending, where it's going, because you have to, you have to, you have to price ahead of the market. So if you're listing today, <clears throat> you really should be saying, okay, well, how much has, what has the market done in the last week or two? What has the trend been? And using that as a guideline, where will it be in a week? And you have to price a week out. Because yeah. if you're not, and you got to be realistic with that. A hundred percent. Like as much as you, you know, people are naturally, oh, you know, I, I hope to get more than, you know, I hope, I wish I could have got as much as I could have in March, but it's not going to happen. So you have to accept that and price a week out and anticipate where the market's going to go price that way. And you will sell. If you don't do that, yeah. you're going to constantly be doing price reductions and struggling to keep up with the market instead of getting ahead of it and sold. And we see that on a daily basis because there are so many houses that have just been sitting and not selling. Well, and that's from unrealistic expectations. Yes. And it also could be from realtors that just want to get the listing, yeah. um, you know, and, and not coaching uh, the seller properly. And we have the unfortunate job of having to give people bad advice or uh, bad, um, not bad, not advice. bad advice. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, some it depends who you're, who you're dealing with, I suppose, but uh, bad news, right. And, yeah. and the bad yeah. news sometimes is the news that you don't want to hear is that your home is worth less than you thought it was worth. Um, yeah. Oftentimes in good times, it's worth like the numbers that we're, we're providing are numbers that, are more than people think their home is worth. Uh, but in times like this, a lot of times a seller will say, but wait a second, I saw my uh, house like mine sell a few weeks ago for X amount of dollars. I should be able to get that or more. 
Um, so that's to your point, you, you have to understand what is the demand for, for the home going to be in the next seven to 10 days? Um, not what was it 20 days ago? Right. hundred percent. Your, your basement looks nice. Oh, thanks. I love it. I spend a lot of time down here. You Speaking did a little which, story post on it the other day and you gave us the tour of, uh, I guess you spent the whole weekend just decluttering and cleaning and, and organizing. Well, I mean, our house is never really cluttered. Like the way you see it now, like pretty tidy. That's usually yeah. how it is. But what I've been doing is, um, what did I do? Oh, I had, so where my desk is now, I had our treadmill, which I've now tucked away behind me in that little nook there. And it flips up, folds up nice the other way. And I had a freezer, so I had to relocate that. So I had to rejig the storage area. One thing we're lacking in this house is storage. So, um, but that also makes us um, more inclined to um, purge more frequently. We don't hoard things. Um, as new things come in, old things go out, but, you know, primarily like kids stuff, toys, clothes, whatever. You know, we don't have boxes of baby clothes for them uh keepsake purposes um don't talk to me about that <laughs> but uh yeah no i enjoy our house it's you know obviously i would love to have a nice house in the pool and uh, all that fancy stuff but you know the way i see it is you know we've invested a little bit of money into our house in the backyard in the basement and uh we're very comfortable and we enjoy the space and you know i could go buy a more expensive house but the way i see it is if we are more i think people need to learn to be more um appreciative of what they have and learn to enjoy the things they have rather than always trying to get better because once you get it then you just see something a little bit nicer you want that uh so for me my goal is we stick it out here we enjoy the space make the most of it invest our money into just that investments buy a rental property instead of buying a bigger property and then 10 years from now, we'll be in a much better position financially. I think people just need to stop spending so much money. Is, is that your way of trying to give me some advice after talking about wanting to buy that house? No, to each their own. It's a nice looking house. <laughs> if, if we had the ability to put a pool in our backyard, we probably, mm -hmm. we, I know we wouldn't move for, for a while because now, now our children have friends in the neighborhood. Um, you know, we've got the park down the street. Like we, we can walk to most things. Yeah. And, um, and it's a nice neighborhood, you know, been here for, for 10 years, don't really want to move, but we can't fit a pool in the backyard and a pool for us is a must. And, um, I don't know if it'll happen or not. You might be stuck with me as a neighbor for a while still. Okay. I never see you anyways. I'm only stuck in my house. <laughs> That's true. You only, you only hear me once in a while. Yeah, it was. It wasn't me whistling, by the way, the other day. I don't know who. It was, that was so weird. Alicia and I both at the same moment. We stopped. We swear we heard somebody outside our side door whistling. So we're like, "Oh, must be Ariel," but it can, clearly it was not. No, no, it was not. Actually, I was thinking one of the podcasts. I should sit in my dining room and uh, open up the uh, uh, shutters there and the for those windows, and you can sit at your uh, side door, and we can do a <laughs> podcast that way because that's only about what. I don't know, 10 feet apart. Yeah. Yeah, that would work. Or we could uh, do it in the backyard still and get our drone to hover above looking down. Yeah. Where is that drone anyway? Does Ian have it? Uh, oh, you've got yeah. one at home. We've got I two. Have, I have one here, yeah. Somewhere. Oh, it's in my closet. Never use yeah. that one. Does, uh, mm -hmm. does Alicia and the kids, do they spend time... Uh, in in the basement as well or is it just you is it your man cave no no not at all we all do i mean i alicia and i watch shows and movies down here when the kids are in bed um the kids sometimes will play video games down here or watch a movie down here but they you usually don't, watch you don't have upstairs. a tv on your main floor no no we so, have a tv in our bedroom which alicia watches most of, more than i do i don't watch a whole lot of tv uh, TV in the living room, family room upstairs. So we have like a loft, second floor of family room. That's where all the kids' stuff is. That's where they watch TV and movies and stuff. Sometimes down here. 
and then in the basement. So nothing on the main floor. Which I love. Yeah, I mean, I've contemplated the idea of it. Like sometimes we'll have people over and um, I remember one time last year and there was a game on it. I can't remember what it was. I'm not into sports at all, so it doesn't bother me. But some of our guests wanted to watch a game. I think it was basketball, whatever it was anyways. Um, so then they came downstairs to watch it, but I don't know. It's kind of nice not having anything up there. See, we, we're very much, a eat dinner and throw something on TV kind of family right now because yes. we don't eat on our dining room table. So oftentimes it'll be in the kitchen on the sofa. We pull out the little, uh, table and chairs for the boys that they have their little dining table. Yeah. And uh and they want to watch something on TV with dinner. So we we let them and we we do it together as a family. Um yeah. but other than that, I, I think it can be a dis- distraction, right? So yeah. Well, for us as, as an example, like our dinner time routine is we always sit at the dining room table. Um and we will have some music playing, but it's I find it's nice because then everyone's interacting and playing and kids are running around um socializing with the two of them and playing with carter and i find um not having that distraction makes us more uh connected connects you a bit more and and we always try to make a note of eating at the dining room table that's our only table uh i mean we have the breakfast bar in the kitchen which sometimes that's where they'll eat but there's only three chairs there so then somebody gets shafted with the sitting on a stool at the end of the the island um but no i like it for us it's a nice routine not having that distraction and the kids are always down there playing. We usually have music on their dancing. That's a big thing they do. I hear some noises. I, I was just going to comment on that. Can you hear it? Yep. I don't know what it is. Anyways. Well, the fact that you've got your whole family above you. Yes. Might be it. I'm surprised I'm not hearing any noises myself because I too am in the basement and yeah. this has become my man cave. Nobody comes down here because this is also where I bring all the groceries uh, in t- because I have the... Um, That's your decontamination zone. It is, yeah. So I set up a uh, little table there and that's where uh, things go to be decontaminated and Lucky we have the sink and the fridge and the freezer down here. Um, yeah. It's basically a mini kitchen, right? So um, I wash everything down here. It stays in the fridge down here. And what I, so something that we're going to change that I'm going to change in terms of um, the groceries and our habits and routines is I'm going to set everything up here almost as a little grocery store. And that's kind of how I have it now. It's almost like a little convenience slash grocery store. So as we need things upstairs, I come down, I stock up, I bring it upstairs. So our fridge upstairs is immaculate and it's beautifully organized and it just has, you know, a few leftovers and the milk and eggs and butter and some condiments and things like that. But the fridge itself is not full of crap and spoiling things and things that are going rotten and whatever. It's nice. It's clean. It's organized. You open something. It's already been washed. You So you can eat it right away. I love it. Can, yeah. can, that That's probably, out of everything that I did in the basement, the two things that I've come to really appreciate during uh, being quarantined, heated floors in the bathroom. Oh, my God. I love it. I'll never not have heated floors and bathrooms again. (laughs) Now that's heated with water, right? Or is it electric? Electric. No, it's electric. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, It's electric. Um, Basically it's just a bunch of wires that, that got implanted uh, before the, um, the tiles went down and I have a thermostat that I sat. And um, so for the hours that I know, like usually from about, 6.30 6.30 a.m. Uh, till about 3 p.m. Uh, is you when... Should have all, you should have all, all that set up on like a, a Google Home and you just say, say something like, good morning, Google, and all of a sudden it sets a routine. So it'll turn on your floors. It'll turn on the, 
whatever your music to the news or whatever like that it's kind of neat they have uh this new i can't remember what it was the other day it said to say hello or good morning google and when when i did that it tells me the weather it tells me the news kind of neat well, it's funny you should say that because Heather wrote an article on uh, LinkedIn about home automation yeah, and uh, it got me thinking. So to your point, I do have the same routines in the morning. Um, now my, my floors are on the thermostat, so it does automatically get heated for 6.30 a.m. Yeah. Uh, and, and stop heating at uh, 3 p.m. Um, but things like my Sonos, I always turn on uh, uh, Fan 590 because I like to listen to my sports radio uh, in the morning, even now during quarantine when there's no sports to talk about. Um, yeah. I turn what on... Do they talk, what do they talk about? Well, I don't know if you've watched uh, The Last Dance on Netflix. No. Uh, I'm talking to the wrong person because you don't care or know anything about sports, but so the last dance is a well, I'm curious it's, about the it's a documentary. It. It's, yeah. It's a documentary about the uh, Michael Jordan and the Chicago bulls and um, the. Oh yeah, yeah. I know. I have heard of it. There's like three, three episodes or something. The, the third and fourth episode just aired um, last week. So um, okay. What was what the hell was the point that I was going to make with it? Uh, my question was, what are sports oh, radio are... hosts talking about? <laughs> right. Uh, so they're talking about when is sports coming back? Like now, a lot of um, the major leagues are talking about potentially playing games in um, a handful of cities that will host those games. So let's say, and Toronto is actually in consideration, believe it or not, with the population, but because of um, available services. So let's just say Scotiabank uh, Arena becomes one of those host areas. They'll have 10 teams play games for X amount of period of time at that arena with no fans. Right. I was going to say. So... <clears throat> And then yesterday or the day before they were talking on, I can't remember whose show it was, but they brought up an amazing point that I thought was just wild to think about. Can you imagine, let's say Scotiabank arena with 19,000 seating capacity, roughly it's just under or just over 19,000. I can't remember. Can you imagine if they opened up the opportunity of selling 20 or 30 tickets and that's it so they would host a, a maple leaf game let's say or a raptors game they would be unaffordable well that's, to who though that's the point well, well that's my that's what i'm saying is it would be a very select few that could afford it it like, would be companies would, it would be companies and famous people well, to, you know, you're a Richard Branson fan, and I don't know much about Richard's uh, uh, hobbies and likes, but let's just say he was a Maple Leaf fan. Uh, could he afford to pay a million dollars to go sit at a game? Sure. Sure. But Can you imagine, as a uber-rich person, being one of only 10 or 20 or 30 people in the arena, like those players are going to hear every single word that you say. So if you wanted to call somebody on the other team, dick face, they are going to hear it. Right. Like, and they're going to know who you are. There's and they're going to know who you are. Can afford it. And yeah. then, so to the <clears> other <throat> point, can you imagine what TV broadcasts would pay? Like broadcasting companies would pay to broadcast those games because of those people being in the stands. Forget the game. Now yeah. you've got Richard Branson or Drake. Drake, let's say Drake is one of five or ten people in the stands for uh, um, for a Raptors game. Uh, and you get now to hear or get reactions of everything that th those fans are are saying in the the audience or in the, uh, yeah. the fans. Our, our, um, our grandchildren will be telling, oh, yeah, little Johnny, when we were kids, even us poor folk used to go to these games. There were tens of thousands right. of people there. <laughs> <laughs> but it it's a possibility. And then so that discussion led to 
not only would there be a lot of money available for those kind of uh, opportunities, but if that money would also be some kind of charitable component to it somehow, right? So, yeah. Um, I so mean, I don't realistically, know. even for rich people to spend that kind of money on a uh, attending a game is probably not really feasible. I don't know. I don't know. Let's Unless get some rich people a, listening to this podcast and get them to chime in. I don't know. Uh, the only way any, they would do it is if they bought it as a gift for a client. Yeah. Right? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I, I would think it's a hell of a marketing opportunity for them. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Like, like if, you, if you want some publicity, especially in times like this, yeah, you know you're going to be uh, televised. You're I don't know if it would be. I don't know if it would be good or bad publicity, depending on that whole charitable component thing. But um, if you're one of ten people at a playoff game for the NBA or NHL, uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure you're making the news uh, right across the globe, right? So yeah, uh, you'd have to be very charismatic. You couldn't just be. You couldn't just be sitting there in the stands like watching the game, not talking, not moving. You got to entertain people. Right. You got an audience. You got to get at least one nose pick in there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you need some reason for the, the media to talk about you afterwards. Do you bad. think open houses yeah. will come back? Of course they will. Listen, I, everyone will forget about it. Everyone will go back to normal. I don't care what you say. And I don't mean you. I mean you people. <laughs> I hope I don't get well, who are you, Don Cherry? Now you people. I mean, uh, like, listen. Who are you people? People, people will. Uh, I'll give you an example. I went on a trip when I was younger to Nicaragua. I was working for World Vision Canada, humanitarian uh, organization. I got to go on a trip with them to go into these um communities and um see the work they were doing and you know you go from first world country to third world and it's like night and day and uh while you're there it gives you a true appreciation for what you have and it just it's uh, it's mind blowing and you see all these little kids with literally nothing that are happier than 99% of the kids that we know in in you know, back home. Um, so while you're there, you really, you really uh, kind of really put things in perspective and you have a real good appreciation for everything from when you turn the tap on, you have fresh water running um, to, you know, always got meals on the table, all that stuff. But, and you say while you're there, oh, it's just really going to be, you know, life-changing experience for me. And sometimes it is. I'm not saying it's not. I'm saying you know, sometimes it is, and maybe it motivates you in some degree. But after you get back and you're immersed in the world again, things get back to normal. You forget about the conveniences. They become, you know, part of your day-to-day -day life, you know, and you don't think about it anymore. And it will get back to that. I'm not saying it won't have any impact on how we live. Um, uh, I think it will have a negative impact on the way we live. I think you know, it is good to be exposed to germs and it helps build your immune system. So I think people need to be cautious of being too concerned about that, especially with children um, and sanitizing and all that stuff. But no, I think it will get back to normal. Uh, it may change and influence the the world and our industry to do things a bit differently, but there will be open houses, 100%. Are open houses needed? Um, yes. Why? Oh, because... You can't just I mean, say yes just, and not answer it. Well, you didn't ask me. Well, you, then you followed well, now up I did. the appropriate question. So uh, why, are, yes. why are they needed? Why are open houses needed? So if, if you I'll, think open houses will come back, which I believe, yes. and I don't yes. believe it's going to be public driven, to be honest, I believe it'll be um, realtor driven. I think realtors will yeah. want to do open houses because for many realtors, that's how they generate new leads, right? That's how they meet new yeah. people. Uh, you have an open house, 20, 10 to 20 people come through that house. 
Uh, a handful of them are looking for somebody to help them find a home. And for out of those four or five people, you make a good connection with one or two of them. And those one or two either call you or you call them and they say, hey, we'd like your help. And that's how you meet potential new clients. That's one way. And a lot of realtors yeah. rely on that. Um, Absolutely. But from a public perspective... Well, I, I think from a public perspective, I don't think it necessarily matters. I think they'll just go with the flow. But I think from a seller's perspective, I think there's been many times where um, even uh, us, we will quite often, I've had instances where I've had existing clients of mine call me and say, hey, Adrian, we went through this open house. We really liked it. Can you get us some more information about it? And all of a sudden now their their casual Sunday uh, habit of going to see a few houses has turned into converting them into potentially buying something. Yeah, but if um, that wasn't if that wasn't the normal, if the only normal was the only way that they could see a home was to call you to begin with, um, yeah. that process may be delayed, right? Like it, instead of looking to buy a house now in April, maybe they're looking to buy a house in September because that's when the wheels uh, kick in. Uh, that mm-hmm. hey, we should call him now. Um, yeah. but if 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 open houses didn't exist, the only way that they could see a home is calling you, uh, then that, that would change that habitual. Uh, it would. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. So, but it, but it won't and, happen. And, and from a seller's perspective, the only benefit that I see that they will would miss if open houses did not exist completely, like if they weren't allowed, let's say yeah. is, when a good realtor is able to make a difference in the showcasing of your home. So as an example for us, and there are a lot of good realtors, you know, in the GTA, um, when somebody comes to visit the home, they get a proper tour and a proper explanation of the features, the benefits and, and the neighborhood of that property. Um, but let's face it, a lot of open houses, you'll, you'll, you'll walk in and you'll be greeted, but not much value to them. So, um, so from that standpoint, you know, you, you kind of got to wonder, um, is, is there a better way? Are they necessary? Um, because from, from a seller's perspective, let's just talk about right now, because open houses are not allowed right now, right? They're, um, it it was a little bit of a time coming before it happened. Like we stopped our open houses, I think it was beginning of March. Um, and it took almost a month for them to, for the boards and, and for our governing bodies to say, okay, now you're not allowed to do them. Right. Um, yeah. But let's just say in a couple of months time now, now the governing bodies say, okay, you, you can have open houses. The seller is exposing their home to a lot of germs, right? You're getting people coming through the house that you don't know where they've been or what they've had or what they have. Um, and so is the realtor. Realtors exposing themselves to all of those people, you know, shaking hands. Like I, I was talking about um, my blog on um, or my uh, article on LinkedIn with you the other day about uh, shaking hands. I don't know that anybody's going to want to shake hands anymore, but um, that was previously what would happen, right? You walk in through the open house, realtor would stick out their hand and say, Hey, welcome to the house. Yeah. Um, But you're also, you're going to be less than six feet away from people if you're at an open house but even if you're not, you're still breathing the same air that, you know, the germs haven't left. Uh, the germs have been exposed to, to that environment. So, so I don't know what's going to happen. I don't, I believe. I don't think in the immediate future, it's going to be a very slow transition back into I having agree. them again. But, I agree. Uh, you know, once everything cleared up with COVID-19 um, and people are comfortable again, it will, things will resume. 
I think this is a real opportunity for uh, real estate as a whole to kind of reinvent itself a little bit, but I don't think it's going to happen because people are going to be stuck in their old ways. I think for us as a team, it's a great opportunity to reinvent ourselves and say, hey, what can we do better now than everybody else? Uh, Because now we're learning how to buy and sell homes with out leaving the house with being mobile, um, with being virtual, right? Um, Absolutely. I mean, I look at myself, I purchased my cottage and you and I purchased an investment property last year. Never even stepped foot in the place. Neither. I never stepped foot in them. Uh, my previous rental property, uh, the condo that we sold when well, we bought I, the cottage, I, had gone, I never stepped in that either. I had I had been in it though, and I gave you my opinion on it. I don't know if that influenced you at all, but I didn't. Um, I didn't remember that you went to you went to actually see it. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. I don't remember that. Yeah. You went um, to see it, and you never made a comment on the condition of the basement or the finishing of the basement. Because let's face no, it, no, because we got it, was, it for forty. We got it for forty thousand dollars under value. I don't care if it I guess, did, I, at, I guess. and the way I saw it is if it didn't have a finished basement, it and was still back, worth the price. That back spot, like whoever chose the colors in that kitchen, yeah, are like I'm colorblind, but I can see colors. Whoever chose the colors in that kitchen can't fucking see colors. It's that bad. Yeah. Hey, going back to what you just said about uh, an opportunity to change. I was chatting with a client recently, and I, he was asking me how I'm doing, and I was. Uh, I've always got a very positive swing on the situation because I feel like it is an opportunity for change. And, um, and I've been very excited about the way I've kind of reconfigured my mind in terms of the activities I'm doing on a day-to-day basis. And I don't think that will change much going forward, even once we're back to normal. Uh, but he said, one of his philosophies is in times of crisis, there's an opportunity for creative creativity, innovation, and transformation. And uh, people that aren't embracing that are going to fall behind and uh, be, if you not be completely pushed out of the industry, uh, they're going to take a huge hit because uh, there are a lot of good business people right now in many industries taking this opportunity to reflect on how they ran business before, uh, how things are going to change going forward, and they're going to come out of the gate um, running on all cylinders and people that have just been you know, not taking that opportunity, they're going to be in trouble. Oh, for sure. I think uh, for for realtors, it's going to be a um, a good thing because I think there's, you know, out of the fifty thousand realtors, I think the stat is about half of them did one or less deals, which means no, no deals uh, in the whole year. Right. Um, so you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of licensed uh, real estate agents that aren't going to be able to afford to be a real estate agent much longer uh, because of the costs um, that are involved and they won't have business waiting for them. Right. Like if, well, and a lot of them haven't felt it yet because they might be getting paid on a deal they did in February or March, but come June and July, their money's going to dry up. Their money's going to dry up and a lot of them have other jobs and if they're not working their other jobs, they can't supplement. They're not going to want to pay their franchise and brokerage fees and their board fees and their training fees and all of the fees associated, let alone having money to market a property or market yourself or Facebook ads or Instagram ads or whatever. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of the um, part-timers and unsuccessful uh, real estate agents will will disappear, which means the top performing agents will will do better. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, nice chatting with you today. I gotta go. This is episode seventy seven of KT Confidential. If you're listening, please make sure that you uh, follow and subscribe so you keep getting these wonderful notifications that tell you we've posted a new podcast which airs every Monday morning. And if you want to watch the video, go to ktconfidential.ca. It'll take you right to the playlist and you can watch all 76 episodes, 77, including this one and more. 
beautiful episodes with my great partner here uh, coming down the line. We actually did a two-hour podcast for episode 76 with Joanna that I watched back. And I'm like, wow, that was a long one. And we started getting did you a watch little, it all back? We That's started cool. getting a little tipsy towards the end. So I'm glad that we uh, we ended it where we did. But um, we're going to have some guests coming on uh, over the next few weeks. We've also talked about starting up a, a new podcast to help realtors and to um, do a little bit of coaching uh, to realtors out there that need it right now. Not only um, people in our network, but people right across the country or the globe. Um, so I'm excited for that. Uh, nice work on your basement. I'm glad that you uh, made a nice area for you to be comfortable in and work out of. And, uh, and these... Uh noise canceling headphones come in handy i can hear very subtle noises in my background i'm sure you can i'm sure you can hear lots of kids well, running around i've i've got my uh the bose whatever they yeah. called quiet comforts the yeah. problem is when i wear them it really just tunes everything out so you can't uh you can't hear yourself at all uh when you're talking so for the podcasts i like uh wearing my mic'd up uh uh earphones Anyway. All right. Well, have yourself a good day. Thanks for listening. Episode 77 of KT Confidential. We'll see you next week. Stay home. Stay safe. Love you.